Tom Little, thank you so much for joining us. You're the chair of the Vermont Legislative Apportionment Board, which is a, a long way of explaining what we're going to talk about today. And you sent out an op-ed to explain to people about redistricting in Vermont. And I thought maybe we could shed some light on the subject and encourage some public participation in this process by doing this interview. So welcome. Thank you, glad to be with you, Lauren Glenn. So um, you have been involved in legislative activities for years and, and you are a wise counsel. So it makes sense that you would be at the helm of this legislative apportionment board. But why don't we start by just explaining what that is and why it's important for Vermonters? Well, it, it's important because uh, when the legislature was originally uh, created and structured and when the Senate actually got added in because initially there was only a house and not a Senate, uh, early on in the uh, 1820s and 1830s, there were attempts made to reapportion the legislature back then because people felt it wasn't fair and it was not sufficiently based upon population. Um, nothing ever happened, however, until uh, the early 1960s, 140 years later, when the some court decisions were made that said, yeah, that isn't fair. Uh, there isn't equal voting uh, access in Vermont because of the one representative per town structure of the house in particular. And what you had, and maybe the, the most uh, stark way to illustrate that is that the town of Stratton had 38 people and one member of the Vermont house. And Burlington had over 35,000 people and had one member of the house. After that litigation, uh, the dust cleared in the early to mid 1960s, the legislature reapportioned itself and established the apportionment board to uh, come into being and uh, start working uh, every 10 years, uh, about 18 months prior to when the legislature had to do its own final version of a new map. Uh, so the apportionment board has met uh, oh, me, about five or six times now every 10 years. And we are uh, in a sense advisory to the legislature, uh, but we take that, that role very seriously and are, will be trying to provide the legislature with as much data and research and uh, redistricting options as we can. And, it, and this is important because the census, the 2020 census numbers are coming in and we know even without those census numbers that Vermont's population has increased, which means we have to redraw the lines. Is that right? But we have to redraw the lines uh, every 10 years, almost no matter what happens to the state population because the state's population tends to shift within the state. Um, and if you've been following the internal population shift trends, um, those have been steady for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, now we have another 10 years worth of that trend. And it shows that um, the population in the Southern part of the state and maybe uh, Southwest Central, Bennington, Wyndham, and Rutland counties um, is continuing to gradually lose population. And the Northwest corner, uh, Franklin, Lamoille, and Chittenden pr predominantly are gaining population. And uh, when you have, I mean, in an ideal world, you would want each house and each Senate district to have the same number of people as each other ones, which means the, the, there's equality of representation. The law has said that, the courts have said that that doesn't have to be mathematically exactly equal. 
but it has to be substantially equal. And you have to make a sincere effort to make it as substantially equal as you can. Uh, at the same time, the, the Vermont law in this area says uh, you should also try to have the legislative districts follow town boundaries and county boundaries. And you should uh, do your very best not to subdivide towns and put them in different districts. Uh, those are, uh, end up being competing uh, or colliding uh, mandates. Uh, and uh, it would be one thing if you said, well, we have 650,000 people in the state. We have 150 house members. We'll just draw, use a computer program of sorts to create 150 house districts that are almost identical in population. And, and people have actually, we've done that as an exercise, but it, may, it bears no very little resemblance to a, a state of Vermont map showing the towns. Uh, and there's a, there's a belief in Vermont that um, keeping the towns distinct within legislative districts is a good thing because it gives a legislative district some cohesion and the people in that legislative district share things in common, not just who their legislative representative is. They may share a school district, they may share uh, other relationships, commercial relationships, and maybe in the old days, they all went to the same market. Um, but in, and in many cases, they're also, they've been in the same house district for a long time and they're comfortable and accustomed to being joined with one or two other towns in that district uh, and they identify that way. Uh, so those are, uh, Lauren Glenn, some competing uh, uh, mandates we have, this, but, but, but the one that, that, that trumps, that comes out on top under the law is the substantial equality of population. Uh, because if you, in the, in the Stratton Burlington case from 1964, uh, in a sense, in an important sense, the people of Stratton compared to the people of Burlington, the Stratton folks were way overrepresented. They had one house member for 38 people. And in Burlington, the, re the residents were grossly underrepresented. Uh, and that's what we have to keep reminding ourselves. We have to, we have to avoid something that stark. And it, it looks like from your op-ed that the number now is one rep per 4,300. That somewhere, somewhere between 42 and 4,300 is the ideal sized single member house district. And we, is have, that... we have a significant number of, of two member house districts. So you would double the size of that for a two member house district. So that's a number really by dividing 150 into the number of people in Vermont, that's not a federal number. Correct, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty simple the arithmetic and to get the, the ideal single member Senate district, you divide the state's population by 30. And if you had a two member Senate district, you would double that. And for the Senate districts, that's um, around 21, 22,000 people for that ideal single member Senate district. Now, why did the legislature vote to break up the six member Chittenden County block of senators? And did they do that in any other part of the state? Uh, no, that was just for the Chittenden Senate district, which was the only one in the state that was had six senators at large. Um, there are the Rutland Senate district has three at large and the Washington uh, district has three at large, as does the Windsor district. Um, it's, it, if you look at other states um, across the country, uh, it's very unusual to have uh, Senate districts with even three people serving at large. Vermont is the only one that has, currently has a six member at large district. Uh, uh, 
and uh, something can be said in favor of smaller districts as promoting better communication between the elected representative and the people being represented. Um, and fundamentally, um, the, 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 the problems that were encountered with a six member at large district were um, instead of representing 21 or 22,000 people, you were representing 140,000 people. Um, and uh, it also made, camp made campaigning for many people very expensive and very difficult. Uh, it, gave, it gave great uh, uh, weight or power to name recognition or to incumbents um, for that same reason. And um, it, it slowly but surely over the last 10 or 12 years, I think even the, the incumbent senators in the Chittenden Senate District came around to thinking, oh, this is really too much. And in 2019, the legislature agreed and amended the law to say that you can't have a Senate district with more than three members at large. So in doing this redistricting work uh, this time around, we are looking at at least reducing that to two, three member districts, but we are also looking at other subdivision uh, options, you know, all the way from six one member districts to three twos or some other combination. So it might be that in your discussions, you scoop up the one member district in Colchester that serves Colchester and the islands in the conversation is that, you know, when you're, are you drawing lots of maps to figure out what to do at this point to address that question also? We're, we're beginning to learn again. One of the problems we've encountered is that the U.S. Census Bureau was under federal law was supposed to deliver us and the other states a final census numbers by March 31. Uh, this spring, we still don't have that, and now we've been we've been told August 15th is going to be when we get the final numbers. But we do have uh, some reasonable population estimates that are 2019 estimates, and we have been using those just to get our our feet underneath us and to look at the districts that are likely to have. Uh, need the most attention. And um, briefly, the methodology that the, the board uses is to uh, establish what the ideal sized district is. And we'll talk about, we can talk about the house ideal now, which is around 4,200 people. We then look at the actual, in this case, so far the estimated population, and we drop all those numbers together into a map of the Vermont House districts. And that tells us for each district, a percentage greater or less than the ideal for the population of that House district. Um, and what the law says is that you should look at the House district with the, the highest positive deviation over their ideal number and compare it to the district with the greatest negative deviation from the ideal. Um, and then you look at the spread between those two districts and that's what's called the overall uh, deviation for the entire map. And the, the law says that number should be reasonably tight. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 courts have never, they, the courts have been careful to not micromanage this process because it, it, at some fundamental level, it has a political tinge to it. And the courts uh, rightly uh, try to stay out of the political arena, but um, uh, something approaching the high teens for an overall deviation, for example, where you had a house district with a minus eight and a half or nine 
deviation, meaning that they have eight and a half percent fewer people in the, than the ideal. Um, and a house district with an eight and a half or nine percent on the high end, creating a deviation of maybe 18 points, that's sort of pushing, pushing it. Uh, it's worth noting that the, the map that the legislature approved in 2012, the house overall deviation is 18.9%. So we have, but no one challenged that in court. And so it became the law and that's what we have now. But using the estimated census data, we've identified um, house and Senate districts that look like their percentage deviations are such that they need, they're going to need some adjustment. So I imagine in particular, you want to hear from people in those communities. So can you say, name a few of them? Yes, that you I, in, in looking at the, at the Senate, uh, the, and, and, and these numbers are, again, are estimated, but, but they're pretty decent estimates. And the, 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 the problematic areas, House and Senate districts, are where you would expect to find them generally if you understand where the population shifts have been. So the Chittenden Senate, Senate district has a very high positive deviation of over 20% now. Um, and the Senate district at the, at the other end of the spectrum is the Bennington Senate district of um, somewhere around a minus uh, nine something. Uh, and that overall, that overall deviation is not uh, acceptable under the law. So we know that something's got to give. So that means that there's 9% less people than needs to be in that district to be representative. To, to be an ideal sized district. Um, and in the house districts, you see the same, the same trend. There are, a, a, I don't know, eight or 10 house districts in the Chittenden Franklin area with deviations of uh, over 10%. And in one case, um, where am I now? There's a, uh, a South Burlington House District with an estimated positive deviation of about 19%. Um, and that's a shift that's happened in the past 10 years, essentially. It, well, it, if, if you looked at those districts 10 years ago or 11 years ago, before we did the, the last um, remapping, you probably would have found those to be have some significant positive or negative deviations, but now it's reached the point where um, they have to be dealt with. Um, then the um, there are a couple of districts in Rutland Town, Rutland City, for example, that have deviations of over ten percent, negative deviations greater than ten percent. So. You're interested in hearing from people across the state, but let's say in particular from these regions, regular people. I mean, you have map makers, you're doing your own mapping on the apportionment committee to kind of mm -hmm. see where you're at, but, but what kind of intelligence could a regular person shed light on, these, on this issue and what kinds of questions are you asking? We're, we're, we're suggesting that, that uh, folks can go to the apportionment board's, uh, board's website on the Secretary of State's website, on the, right on the banner across the top of the Secretary of State's website, there's an apportionment board uh, place to click and you can go find minutes of our meetings and a lot of materials about the reapportionment from 10 years ago and some of the, 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 uh, the efforts we're making now. But, um, at a very fundamental level, I think it's the starting place is to figure out what district you're in right now. Um, and uh, uh, that's 
something that people end up figuring out when they go to the polls because you got to know where to show up to vote. But um, uh, once we get these, these census data, we will be posting them and then you would be able to go to our a map on our web page that says, okay, I live in the Bennington three house district or the Franklin six house district. Um, what does my percentage deviation look like? Um, maybe more importantly, um, uh, Lauren Glenn would be um, get familiar with the other towns in which your district is located. And if you, you know that something is likely to have to change about your district because of a high or low population uh, count, the, the trickiest question is how do you fix that? Now, if, if you have a, a district uh, with a significant negative population deviation, the simplest way to fix that would be if the, if the house district right next door has excess population. You can say, well, well, we'll move a town around. Keeping in mind that we're supposed to really try really hard not to subdivide a town. Um, um, so you could say, well, the district next to us has four towns in it. We can move one of those towns over into our district and everything will be evened up. But if you're in an area of the state, um, and this is true in, in the southern part of the state where you have a low, you have a significant negative population deviation in your house district and you're surrounded by other house districts with the same problem, it's not so simple because taking people from another, another district is gonna exacerbate their population uh, deficit and that'll bump the solution to another district beyond them and conceivably another one further out. And so trying to fix a problem with one district is really uh, often, and right now in particular parts of the state, a, a regional solution needs to be found. We've received some um, citizen input already um, Interestingly, um, one dealing with a, in the Chittenden Senate where the, the towns that are in the Mount Mansfield Unified Union School District, which are Underhill, Jericho, Richmond, Bolton, and Huntington, I believe. Um, they're looking at the subdivision of the Chittenden Senate District and saying, we, we want, uh, our five towns want to be in the same Senate District. We think that makes sense. We'll have more cohesion. We'll have, we know who our representatives are and they'll, they'll be more, they'll care more about us because they're not representing 140,000 people. Um, those five towns are not large enough to form a single member Senate district. So you have to add other towns. One of the challenges there in particular is that 10 years ago, the town of Huntington was moved into the Addison Senate district, uh, not because there was a groundswell of, of public sentiment in Huntington that that's what they wanted to do, but because um, the population in the Addison Senate district was on the low side. And because Brandon, town of Brandon, which had been in the Addison Senate district for about 20 years, but which is a Rutland County town, had to be moved back into the Rutland Senate district. So the Rutland Senate district could continue to support three senators. That left a gap in the Addison Senate district uh, the apportionment board's recommendation 10 years ago was, uh, and, and, and if you look at the contours of Addison County, on one side is Lake Champlain. So you can't add any people from Lake Champlain. Um, at the south side, it's Rutland. You, because of the Rutland population problem, we couldn't add them there. On the east side, you're up against the Green Mountains 
um, and some very small towns. And we try not to put towns on one side of the Green Mountains and it was Senate District on the other side. That really only left the, the northern part of Addison County and the southern towns in Chittenden County, which are Charlotte, Hinesburg, and Huntington. The apportionment board's recommendation was Charlotte. Legislature said, no, we're going to put Huntington in. Um, so to, to, to uh, address the residents of the Mount Mansfield Union School District um, folks, so their, their concerns, you'd have to take Huntington out of the Addison District, but probably take either Hinesburg or Charlotte and put it in unless you're going to take a much uh, more uh, bold approach to this and say, well, what if Addison isn't a two member district? What if we divide that into two one member districts and maybe we can get more creative that way and we won't run into this problem with Huntington? Um, so those are the, it sounds like that's the kind of questions that you're interested in feedback from the public about. Right, we, we've asked uh, the public, um, do you have a preference in general over a single member house district versus a two member house district? Um, and do you feel strongly um, about the importance of following town lines and keeping towns intact? Um, do you prefer single member Senate districts? Should we go to all single member Senate districts, for example? And the, the apportionment board did a, a version of that 10 years ago, uh, just to see what it would look like. And it doesn't look at all like a county map, no, no surprise. Uh, interestingly in Vermont, while we have this statute that um, talks about trying to preserve county lines, um, our county government in Vermont, our counties don't have much governance value or meaning in Vermont. Uh, but nevertheless, people identify with the county they're in. Um, and uh, I mean, Vermont in the, at the county level, we have assistant judges, two assistant judges, a sheriff, probate judges get elected on a county basis in the state's attorneys. Um, but it's not, if you want to go across the lake to New York state, there are county uh, rep, uh, assemblies. They have county uh, elected representatives and we don't, we don't do that here, but our statute, um, I think, which dates back to the 1960s where the old Senate map was a county map. Um, and every, every county had one Senator except the larger counties with pop, larger population had additional ones, but that wasn't apportioned equally either. Um, and it was very, very hard to change uh, when populations shifted. This reminds me of Frank Bryant's famous maps that he shows, Professor Frank Bryant at UVM of the various districts of service delivery, whether it's the legislative district, the solid waste district, the agency of human services district. I mean, they're just, nothing coincides in Vermont. And I wonder if that's because of our exceptionalism or you know, the strength of the locality as kind of the prime uh, self-identification that we have. I'm not sure what the reason is, but it must make it hard. We, we, we have been working with um, the Vermont Center for Geographic Information, which is a, a, a not all that well-known piece of state government, but uh, they have been extremely helpful in the mapping area. And they can show you maps of almost I mean, anything you can imagine and things that you can't imagine, but you're right. There are layers and layers of various uh, governance districts, utility. If you look at a map of the utility coverage in Vermont, that's a very distinctive looking map. 
uh, fire districts in some towns uh, are, are still uh, active. And then you have um, Act 250 district districts, um, planning districts. Um, so we've evolved these uh, regional governance districts, maybe because our counties don't mean anything in, in terms of governance. Um, and one of the ways that when we write, it, write up our final report, this is more, more so about the House uh, redistricting than the Senate, is that we try, particularly if we're bundling a, a group of towns into a House district that have not all been together before, or at least recently in a, in a district together, we try to, to uh, in a narrative description, uh, give reasons why it makes sense for these towns to be together and what they have in common with each other, uh, which may be geography, it may be a school district, uh, it may be some other historic ties. Uh, I, I did this work uh, 10 years ago as well. And what I found out in addition to the ties that bind uh, are the, the ties that, that divide. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a funny story I can tell in that regard, but we received a letter at the, at the apportionment board from a town. Uh, for the time being, I'm not gonna mention these, the name of these towns, but that said that we think that, uh, the best house district for us would be a, a two member district with, with our town and then the three towns uh, west of us in one two member district. Um, and of course, in that particular configuration, the town that wrote us because of its population would dominate that house district. About a week or so later, we got a letter from the town at the west end of that configuration of towns that said, whatever you do, don't put us in a house district with that town. And it, uh, which we, we chuckled at, and it, re it reminded me at the time and, and now of, of what it was like the first day of, of school in middle school or, or junior high school in the cafeteria when everyone's deciding who they're going to sit with and who they're not going to sit with. And there's some of that, um, it goes on in the, in the house redistricting where there might be two towns that to an outsider might look like they have perfect harmony together, but there's some reason, in one case it was a, it was a high school football rivalry that they really didn't want to be together. <laughs> There comes a time, and it's going to come very, very soon. Um, our deadline uh, for getting our work done uh, was supposed to be the end of July. But since we d won't have the U.S. Census figures until at least the middle of August, the legislature extended our deadlines. One of our, our, our public uh, engagement uh, processes is we will be issuing a, 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 an initial house map, sort of a preliminary house map and sending it out to all the towns, publishing it uh, on, our, on our website and all of that. Um, and a town that uh, disagrees with how it's been placed in a district, particularly a town that we propose to subdivide or to put into a two member district. Those towns have the right to hold a public hearing, uh, take testimony, and then send us a counter proposal or criticisms of our initial mapping proposal. Um, all those comments will, are, will be coming back to us from the, the boards of civil authority in each town and the board of civil authority uh, in each town is the select board members and the justices of the peace plus the town clerk. 
And, and that unit of government is chosen in large part because in towns, um, it's the board of civil authority that has um, a sort of oversight authority over local elections. Uh, and they have some local expertise in that regard. Um, and when will you file your proposal with the legislature? Well, the, we were so, under our, our statute, we're supposed to get all of this stuff done by the end of July. Um, but the, since the US Census Bureau has failed to send us the data that we need, the legislature enacted some changes that pushed this out into the late summer and into the fall. So if I had to make a, uh, a estimate of when we would be getting this map out to the towns, I would say sometime in the middle to the end of September. Well, let's be in touch when those maps are um, drawn so that we can generate some more interest. And in the meantime, I really appreciate your time and the work of the apportionment board, the legislative apportionment board in making sure that we get the kind of representation that we deserve in the state of Vermont. You got it. My pleasure. See Thank you soon. Thank you, Tom Little. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.